so dysmorphology in uh, in that era when we were students used to be really like uh, see the patient then make a list of symptoms then you go into these all books and try to make a list of symptoms that is present in the book and see what is overlapping with what uh, so that was really uh, difficult painstaking and that was where maybe uh, the experience used to come into place if you have seen a patient with one particular syndrome second time it is mostly a just you see and uh, we used to always feel like how oh, madam suddenly diagnosis the uh, conditions so but uh, that is what was just taught or the experience uh, that used to teach but then that causes problem for a beginner how does a beginner uh, do and uh, uh, so the first uh, uh, few papers that uh, i think first paper that we saw uh, this was in 2004 or something in american journal of medical genetics they had uh, uh, published a paper where uh, they had used uh, something called as morphometric analysis so basically you take the photograph of the patient you take normal photographs and you put a uh, uh, kind of spots on the photograph so on the landmarks so tip of the nose you put a spot corner of the eye uh, wherever there is a proper landmark you can't put in the middle of the cheek because that will be different for different people but actual landmarks if you put and then uh, the com- the software calculates the distance and the ratios between the distances what our eyes cannot see or cannot discern the computer was able to discern and they had uh, shown this uh, thing for noonan syndrome uh, in that paper and uh, uh, so as madam told yesterday i had this so i still have a love for computers and also that time uh, uh we thought why not uh, let us do so then we did a lot of search and uh, uh, we used uh, the same thing then uh, i put together some normal photos and we had uh, four cases that madam had of uh, uh, rubinstein type syndrome and <laughs> we put that and we could clearly show uh, that these four rubinstein type syndrome cluster separately in a principal component analysis and the normals are forming a different cluster so that was really exciting at that time uh, to be able to do what others had done uh, uh, we also published that paper in a, a quite different kind of journal it was computer methods in biology or something uh, but th- that was really interesting but we thought oh, uh, i don't know whether it will happen in future or not and then slowly for many more diseases also these articles came and then this uh, we have the phase 2 gene which is now millions of photos they have accumulated and uh, uh, that is routinely used it is usable in the clinic itself on your mobile you can have that uh, app and uh, that is helpful but also madam must have told you these all things are tools for experts so they will not make a expert diagnosis so phase 2 gene also will give you so many syndromes uh, ultimately you have to put in uh, a little effort or give it more information the more information you give so in addition to the photographs if you give information what is not there in the photograph or something your diagnosis uh, becomes more uh, refined kind of thing so still this morphology holds uh, a role uh, especially when today itself we'll discuss it's even after advent of ngs when you are facing a vous in a dysmorphic syndrome again the dysmorphic features become your reverse phenotyping that you have to do so dysmorphology ability to detect those abnormalities uh, i don't know if you have been told there is a uh, a collection called elements of morphology in uh, it's freely available on american journal ah, yes. so so you have to understand what is normal and what is abnormal and use those right words okay some words like elongated nose long nose and all that doesn't mean anything so whole world should use the same word and that is why this uh, elements of morphology was created where all the dysmorphology terms along with the photographs have been put together so uh, it's interesting if you want to go into it then all these uh, information are available so today uh, yesterday we discussed about the variants in uh, ngs what are the uh, ngs analysis or in sanger sequencing what are the different types of variants that you may get and then we had some idea okay if it is a stop codon it is going to cause disease if it is a synonymous it is less likely to cause disease but these are all very 
gray area kind of ideas ultimately to give a sure shot diagnosis to the patient we need to have certain rules or certain criteria to say that anybody in the world should say the same thing it should not be that one lab says that it is benign and the other says that it is pathogenic so it should not be subjective to bring in some objectivity the acmg guidelines uh, were made where the whole world agrees that we have to classify every variant into one of these categories so we'll go about uh, today uh, looking at how these variants can be classified and it is not really difficult uh, at the end of this lecture i hope that all of you are able to classify the variant into these five categories and we have so many tools to help us for doing that so the first question comes why do we need to interpret a variant so there is a variant you can give a diagnosis you find a variant you give that it is this is causing okay so what do we see here yeah there are dried leaves yeah so something like dry leaves but for a small insect it is going to be very dangerous because this is a chameleon which has taken the color of dry leaves okay on the other hand what do you see here would you do this yeah this is a so this is a very harmless looking organism which can be very harmful to the small insect this is a very harmful looking organism but he is very friendly with the person okay so you can have a very harmless looking variant that can be disease causing we saw yesterday that uh, progeria. progeria can be caused by a synonymous mutation and you have so many harmful looking variants so many frame shift mutations so many stop codon mutations which are present in so many of us also and they are not uh, causing any problem okay so you, your job is really to differentiate between this what is obvious may not be what is correct so you have to decide what is correct and what is wrong so we have seen this yesterday the variation mutation and polymorphism who is this guest today the so guest to go out on his own <laughs> okay so we have clarity about this words variation polymorphism mutation although we are not going we are going to try not to use the word mutation we try to use the word variation good so so we'll try to use the word variation instead of notation although the word comes out because we have learnt it over so many years but we make a active effort not to use the word notation okay now the next question comes can i do variant interpretation so it is very important in today's world that uh, we used to have initially the wet lab people the the scientist would be working in the lab the clinician will be working in the hospital the computer scientist will be working with his computers but in today's world this whole thing has come together everyone needs to have some knowledge of these other domains in addition to your own domain so a scientist without a good collaboration with a clinician can really not do much in today's era a scientist without knowing the bioinformatic principles with this huge data of proteome exome genome transcriptome you really cannot visually analyze or humanly analyze that data a bioinformatician without the clinical or the uh, biochemical analysis it becomes useless so it's a combination where you have a strong domain of yourself but if you have some knowledge of the other domains you are able to perform in a much better way so in today's class we are going to say that anybody can dance so anybody can do a variant interpretation but that is only if you follow certain steps okay if you want to do a gestural diagnosis that will not work with the variants okay variants have to be systematically studied 
and if you follow these six steps mm -hmm. then you are able to interpret any variant that you are confronted with so these six steps basically involve first is the information about location and functional effect of the variant yesterday's whole class was on this step so this step is basically yesterday what we discussed depending on the location exonic mutations splice site mutations are more likely to be disease causing promoter mutations intronic mutations utr mutations are less likely to be disease causing similarly missense mutation synonymous mutation less likely to be disease causing splice site mutation stop codon mutation frame shift mutation more likely to be disease causing so these informations you are going to use as one of the criteria so it is not the only criteria it is the first one criteria that you are going to use to decide based on acmg guidelines whether this is pathogenic or not the second is the frequency of this uh, variant in normal population we spoke yesterday if a variant is common in normal population we don't consider it disease causing the third is whether this variant is reported in similar cases or patients with similar phenotype elsewhere the fifth is use of certain pathogenicity prediction software to predict what this variant could cause the fifth evidence is mendelian segregation analysis in the family and the sixth is functional assay now if we systematically go through each of these steps then we should be able to interpret any of the variants so let us go step wise so the first step we have seen yesterday so the structure of the gene is important to note and based on the structure of the gene the splicing machinery we have the location based and the functional effect based classification and we have some idea which the acmg guidelines will give certain score depending on what type of variant it is okay so we'll not discuss about that because we discussed in detail yesterday about that we come to the next evidence that is frequency of this variant in normal population so why this frequency becomes important population wise how much are we similar to chimpanzee yeah how much you want to be similar to chimpanzee how much we are we cannot change how much you want to be similar yeah so we are 99% similar to the chimpanzee genome okay and we among each other how much are we similar 99.9% so it is the 0.1% difference between us which makes us all different from each other but 0.1% of 3 billion is a big number okay so these are all the different variations which make all these humans different from each other the caucasian the african or the characteristics that we all share that we are all different from each other it is because of this genetic difference as well as the environmental effect that is there however if you look at this point one difference this difference is different among different populations okay so if you put these populations together you will form clusters of caucasian separately african separately asian separately that is because of interbreeding there is no much although it is there today but in our evolution a caucasian would not mate with a asian or something so there has to be segregation of these populations over generations and that has led to different kind of variations in different populations that is why polymorphisms are different in a caucasian population in african population or asian population okay now that creates problem for us that if the population database is a caucasian database the indian polymorphism may not be there in that and falsely you will feel that this is not present in general population it may be a disease causing mutation okay because our premise our uh, the uh, hypothesis is that if the variant is less in the population it is likely to cause disease but variant is less or more you will know when you study the population and if you study a different population and compare with a different population you are going to end up with problems and this problem we still face because although we have large number of databases of many other populations we still do not have a indian database a large enough indian database of indian polymorphisms now this is a very important uh, slide to understand what are different genetic diseases or from the genetic point of view so if you have 
the effect size effect size means how much that variant is contributing to the disease if you have effect size on the y axis and you have the frequency in the population on the x axis okay so here there will be variants which are very less in the population but they have very low effect size okay so these variants are not really of much interest to us because they do not have much effect size okay on the other hand here there are variants which are common in population but again they have low effect size okay this again is not very important to us what we are interested in is rare variants with high effect size because they are the ones going to be disease causing okay so we are interested mainly in variants which are less in population and high in effect size okay so that is why we are going to look at nonsense frame shift loss of function notations which are less in population they are on our high list of being probably pathogenic okay so these are the various uh, databases that are available the first one was the 1000 genomes database you can see the there are 2500 uh, genomes that were done here from different 26 populations throughout the world then you had the exome variant server the initial database what was created from exomes then we had the exact the exact got converted into the genome id this nomad is the most commonly used database now because it has more than lakhs of uh, genomes that are uh, aggregated there and then you have certain uh, small databases uh, like the great middle east so middle east people got together and formed their uh, database then genome asia was a database which was uh, some part was done by med genome uh, from india but the mainly the patients were from the south asian countries so you had uh, from singapore and uh, all those countries then singapore had its own uh, 10000 genome and then there was a south asian genome so all these databases mainly that is the reason that you need all these databases because the polymorphisms are not same in all parts of the world okay so all these databases are available uh, with their websites and they are freely available for anyone to use okay so these are the websites of all these uh, databases uh, that you can access so if you find a particular variant and you want to know is this variant reported in any of this population database you can go to that particular website and you can enter the variant and it will give you whether it is present in that database or not there have been some efforts to create indian databases but the numbers are very less like from tata medical uh, center there was a small study then uh, we had uh, uh, another study called indi genomes from the igib and we ourselves created uh, in 2021 a database of about 1455 individuals which was basically exomes put together after removing the disease causing variant because if you remove the disease causing variant all other variant in that individual represents the population variant in that population so we had collected these exomes from sgpgi from aims new delhi from our center and from kmc manipal we put together all these exomes made a database and uh, that was created and that is really helping us to rule out those uh, polymorphisms which are not pre present in these other populations so this is the paper that we had uh, published together where we put together exomes from all these four centers and on our uh, website of cdfd we have provided uh, the whole database uh, free to use now in addition to this there is a major effort uh, going on which hopefully should com be completed by the end of this year that is december is the target for genome india so genome india is a large database of about 10000 indian populations where whole genomes are being sequenced okay so hopefully by the end of this year we will have 10000 normal indian genomes database and that is going to make our life much more easier when we want to interpret a variant so that is about population database so now you see that is it present in population database if it is present then you mark that variant as polymorphism 
you are not going to think that this will be disease causing even if it is a stop codon mutation but it is present at 10% 15% frequency in normal population you will directly mark it as benign okay the third evidence is whether this variant is reported in similar cases throughout the world and for that we have databases like omim we have clinvar so clinvar is a very important a very useful database where we also submit the cases so it's like a collective database where everybody submits and everybody benefits so whoever gets a variant they do the classification and submit to clinvar clinvar collects all of them and it is free to use by anybody so the world is helping each other to gather all these variants so throughout the world you will get uh, variants in patients with various genetic diseases being submitted there pubmed is a very important uh, where you can find the article where that particular variant might be described and human gene mutation database is also a very good database the problem is that it is a paid database you need to pay to use it but these are some of the databases which will give you variants in known patients with particular genetic disease now if a variant is present in any of these databases it makes you think this is very likely to be disease causing if another patient with the same phenotype had the same variant your patient has the same variant and the same phenotype you will naturally interpret that this is a pathogenic variant okay so these are all just evidences or what you say uh, inclinations nothing is final at this point okay we are just gathering evidence the next evidence is pathogenicity prediction so where why do we have to go to pathogenicity prediction so suppose you have done the location based classification and you did the population database identification if the variant is present at high frequency in the population directly it will go to benign no further analysis is needed if the variant is not present in population then it still has a probability being disease causing you go to the known disease databases if it is present in known disease databases it goes to pathogenic again the algorithm stops there okay so benign and pathogenic can be easily done by only these three steps problem comes when the variant is less in population and not reported earlier that means this is a novel variant and this is the variant which is causing a lot of problem to us unless you are able to put it into benign or pathogenic these are the variants which will remain in vo us or variant of uncertain significance so for that now we have different ways how to analyze these variants of uncertain significance so one of them is the pathogenicity prediction software these are not pathogenicity deciding software okay and that is why we have more than 100 such software available because everybody says my is better than yours okay because these are all predictions this is not a final answer but how do these uh, software work so this software have different uh, properties of the variant they make use so one is the alignment we spoke yesterday the conservation score is this variant or is this amino acid same in humans chimpanzee rat mouse you go as much as possible so is it conserved across species okay secondly it looks at the sequence and look at the biochemical the physiochemical properties of that particular amino acid then it looks at the structure of the protein whether the structure is going to get changed and then some other annotations from different uh, uh, prediction scores from uh, uh, different databases of proteins ultimately using a machine learning approach it will give some output okay this is a total black box for us we don't come to know you give a variant it just throws out likely to be pathogenic likely to be benign okay but we need to know how it works but ultimately every software will have some or the other algorithm to ultimately give you the prediction and we usually use multiple software to make a decision one software we don't make our decision so the conservation across species you can see if you look at the amino acid sequence in a protein in human chimpanzee mouse rat and cow if you see this amino acid alanine it is alanine in all these species okay that tells us that this is a very important amino acid it has not changed right from rat up to humans so any mutation at this amino acid we are going to consider it likely to be disease causing on the other hand you can see here this is leucine and chimpanzee has leucine 
but mouse has proline, rat has proline. So this amino acid is okay. If it gets changed, no problem to the protein. So this amino acid will be lower in the category of disease causing. Similarly, you look at the biochemical properties. Is a positively charged amino acid getting changed to a negatively charged? Is a charged amino acid getting changed to a non-charged amino acid? Is a polar amino acid becoming non-polar? Is a small amino acid becoming big? Is a aromatic becoming linear? Okay. So these physiochemical and biochemical properties again will be used to see what amino acid change is there. The third is the structure. So protein has a primary structure that is the sequence. This gets into secondary structure that can be alpha helix or beta pleated sheet. And these alpha helix and beta pleated sheet, yesterday we have seen some structures. They come together to form the tertiary structure. Now, when this structure is forming, again, bioinformatically, you can see whether this structure will get affected because of the change in the amino acid. Now, putting all this together, ultimately, it gives out some evidence. And so there are a number of these uh, databases, uh, these uh, pro software available, like Swift, Polyphen, CAD, Provian. We have so many, more than 100 are there. And we can use all of them in combination to ultimately get the probable answer. Okay. So each of these has their own uh, uh, website where you can, Mutation Tester is a very user-friendly kind of uh, uh, software which puts together multiple different software together. So you can use it uh, easily in your clinic also. So these uh, CAD scores are basically uh, more objective kind of because it gives a score, whereas all these uh, give probably pathogenic, less pathogenic like that. Human splice finder is for the splice site mutation. So different software are available to make use of. Now that is up to there. You have now decided based on the software that it is pathogenic or benign or variant of uncertain significance. And mostly till here only most of the companies will do for you. Okay. Ideally, Mendelian segregation should be a part of the report, which all labs do not do. But without Mendelian segregation, it is difficult to interpret a variant. And with Mendelian segregation, many times we are able to change the classification of the variant. So Mendelian segregation is looking at the variant in other family members because single gene disorders follow Mendelian inheritance pattern. So you could either have a heterozygous variant in the proband or a homozygous variant. So what do you do in each of these situations? So suppose you have got a heterozygous variant in the proband, which is a VOUS. And now you want to check in the parents. So what are the probabilities? What possibilities are there when you check in the parent? Yeah. Both can be carriers. If both are carriers, both should have been affected, no? This is a heterozygous variant. Heterozygous means what disease we are considering? Autosomal dominant. If autosomal dominant, if both were carriers, you would have that both were affected. Okay? But probability is there that both can be carrier. What other probability is there? One is a carrier, other is not a carrier. Or third probability is both are not carriers. Okay? So when you find that both parents are normal for this variant, then you say that this is a de novo variant. De novo variant by ACMG classification is a very strong evidence to take a vivo US2 likely pathogenic because de novo variants are considered to be more likely to be pathogenic if all other things are matching. Okay, if phenotype is not matching, then don't, don't say it because every meiosis there will be some de novo variant. Every one of us has de novo variants, okay? But all de novo variants don't cause disease. But if there is a de novo variant in a gene which is matching the phenotype in your patient, then that de novo variant carries a lot of value. So that is why segregation analysis in a heterozygous variant is very, very important to make the interpretation. However, if you get one parent as a carrier, then usually you will think that the parent should have got the disease. The only thing that you need to remember is the reduced penetrance of that particular disease. So if that disease is known to show reduced penetrance, then you will have to think how to consider this variant. Okay. But if that disease is not known to show reduced penetrance, then you will consider this as a 
normal polymorphism because parent has the child has so this is not likely to cause disease okay now we come to a homozygous variant so again what are the possibilities here can both parents be normal here yes both can be carrier or yeah if both are normal can it be both are normal what is consensus so two de novo mutations that two in the same location is too too difficult to happen okay the probability is very low that de novo mutation in the same location will happen in both the parents first of all de novo itself is not a very common phenomena okay so the possibilities are one is that both parents are carriers which usually confirms your interpretation that it is a homozygous because both parents are carriers and likely to be pathogenic if one parent is homozygous and the other is normal and the child is homozygous what do you interpret now x linked yeah x linked x linked if it is on x chromosome if it is on autosome x linked again if mother will not be homozygous no? mother to be homozygous both x chromosomes have to have so there are very very rare possibilities where mother will be homozygous g6pd yeah mother will be heterozygous g6pd can be homozygous that's what i'm saying it's very rare that she, uh, her mother has to marry a male with g6pd deficiency and then she can be homozygous okay so in this situation you are going to consider this variant very less likely to be disease causing if mother is homozygous and the child is homozygous and child doesn't have the disease then it is unlikely okay but how did child become homozygous so second has to be either de novo or you if you have not studied the father or the father might be a carrier okay what is that phenomena called you know where homozygous marries a heterozygous pseudo dominance very good yeah and if one parent is a heterozygous and the other is normal and the child is homozygous yeah if one parent is heterozygous de novo is a rare possibility so one is a large deletion in the mother what other possibilities are there one parent heterozygous we will discuss about it but again this is a possibility this still can be we will discuss in detail about this particular possibility so now this can help you to change the variant interpretation from vo us to uh, likely pathogenic or pathogenic okay and the last one is functional assay x ring recessive x ring recessive you are going to see only mother and child so if mother is not a carrier and child is hemizygous possible no most of the many of the x ring are de novo so it can happen and if mother is a carrier that also matches so in x ring recessive it's not really going to change your interpretation I didn't understand your question. Yeah. So here it is not possible to be X-linked because father is the carrier. Yeah. in this situation you are saying yes yes unlike to capital yes in our in x specific condition or when the segregation study so whether it is that's what i'm saying x link you will not get a clue because mother is not a carrier still you do prenatal isn't it have you gone through this why do we do prenatal in a dmd even if she is not a carrier 
कॉनाडल मोजेसिजम और जर्म लाइन मोजेसिजम सो डूइंग कैरियर एनालिसिस इन मदर इन एक्स लिंक इज नॉट रियली चेंजिंग योर डिसीजन इफ मदर इज फाउंड टू बी कैरियर अगेन इट मैच विथ योर सेग्रीगेशन सो इन एक्स लिंक डूइंग सेग्रीगेशन इज नॉट रियली चेंजिंग योर डिसीजन रिगार्डिंग द वेरियंट Okay. Germline mosaicism is basically seen in X-linked disorders. No, no, it is seen in autosomal dominant also. So autosomal dominant disease also you can get germline. That's why patient comes with tuberous sclerosis in first child. Parent is not a carrier. Still, we will advise them to do prenatal diagnosis. Patient comes with neurofibromatosis. Parents are not carrier. Still, we will advise them because autosomal dominant disorders also are known to show gonadal mosaicism. Okay. this one so parent is homozygous child is homozygous parent is not affected why you will feel child is affected with that disease okay huh? what is it so incomplete penetrance typically with uh, recessive disorders is very rare i don't know if there is any i have not heard of any disease which is recessive and incomplete penetrance okay it is a non disease causing variant so this is not a disease causing so you are still yet to decide so once you see this that mother is homozygous and normal child is homozygous seven disease this variant is not related to this disease child has some other variant which is causing the disease so your variant gets nullified your disease is still there but your variant gets less importance okay third one will come to in more detail we'll come to third one in another lecture okay so the last one is functional assay which sometimes you can do but sometimes it is difficult every gene may not be having a easily available functional assay so we do uh, functional assays like cell line based assay yesterday i showed you either you can do a enzyme assay after site directed mutagenesis in the lab if the patient is available you can directly do the enzyme assay in the patient's blood you can do a western blot subcellular localization to see where the protein is localized real time pcr luciferase assay for transcription factors so depending on what is the function of the protein a functional assay has to be done to see if the protein function is affected or not okay tissue based studies can be done that is induced pluripotent stem cells you can create the mutation in the induced pluripotent stem cell and see whether it causes or model organisms like the fruit fly or drosophila zebra fish or mouse can be used again but these are more into the research domain what is the best functional assay or best evidence for disease based on functional activity protein test ha huh? manifestation second patient with same phenotype with same variant is the best evidence okay rest all is you are just collecting evidence but once you have two three four patients ivs15 g2c mutation 50% of patients with thalassemia will have this mutation in the world you will never say that this you don't have blindly you can say it is a disease causing so when you have multiple patients and that is where our clinvar helps us a lot that if there are 5 6 7 reports of patients having same variant and same disease you don't have to do any of these things you can believe that others have found the same you report the same okay but when that is not available you have to take the help of all these things okay so now we have gone through all these evidences very important like if there are two affected and two unaffected individuals in the family same family so yeah. that four would be quite enough like two are homozygous for the variant yeah. and two unaffected are not homozygous yeah so also two three like a um, number is so, okay matlab can not but at least if there are four five siblings yeah, yeah. and those two three affected that may not, not happen commonly uh, but uh, that is good enough evidence yeah. again but still uh, there also remains a possibility that two may be homozygous for normal variants also so that probability remains so if it is for a known disease it is more easy to interpret novel gene it is little difficult because even polymorphisms can be homozygous in two 
uh, children who are affected and may not be homozygous in others. So that's why number, number of siblings more the affected. The more the evidence. Yeah. So that's yeah, there, that there is the numbers at one point one point confidence. So, so in the clinical paradigm, what we can use is either enzyme assay for a lysosomal enzyme or a hormone assay or something called as reverse phenotyping. That is very important when you do a lot of exome sequencing nowadays. Any patient, nowadays nobody spends time looking at the dysmorphology and all that. Any patient that comes in, you cannot directly diagnose, just order for exome. So it is a genotype first approach that also has its own benefits, but genotype first approach has to be supplemented by a reverse phenotyping. That is when the report comes back, then you again sit with the clinical features in the particular disease and tick what is present in the patient and you see whether you can match them with the clinical features or not. Because many times the lab who is doing does not have access to the patient. So they are just believing what you have written. And many times what you write is patient of intellectual disability exome. So now there is nothing for the lab to correlate. They will just give you a variant. So it is your job now to do a reverse phenotyping, do certain more investigations like X-ray, MRI, CT, if that particular disease has something that can be detected or clinical evaluation for the dysmorphic features. So that is why I was saying that even in today's era, dysmorphology still holds some importance in those dysmorphic syndromes, okay? So what is reverse phenotyping for different, like suppose it is a Hunter syndrome variant has been found, you will just do the enzyme activity for MPS2. If calpenopathy is a variant is found, you can do a muscle biopsy and the immunoblot analysis. If HNPPP, PMP22 variant is found, you can do nerve conduction latency, look at the clinical feature. If you found a VOUS in a gene that is known to cause a dysmorphic syndrome like coffin siris, look for all these features in the photographs that you have seen. So this is what you will do as the reverse phenotyping to look for, now focused way you will look for what has been reported in that disease, you will actively look in the patient. Okay, uh, yes and no, because uh, see, uh, if you don't have any other variant in that gene, then uh, what are you thinking? And uh, other things are matching. So if there are no feature of Hunter syndrome and you find a variant, you're not even going to think of doing a enzyme assay. But if you have all the features of Hunter syndrome and instead of doing enzyme assay, you have done exome first. Then if you do an enzyme assay, then it is a corroboratory, corroboratory evidence kind of that this variant and this mutation you are putting together. The functional assay criteria of ACM we were saying. Yeah, yeah, that could be because the functional assay criteria of ACMG was limited to creating a mutation and then doing a functional assay. So uh, this can happen especially uh, Little less likely with uh, LSDs because here we have a strong phenotype and this, but maybe if it is some muscular myopathy or something where you have a general kind of phenotype, there you are not sure that this is the variant which is causing the disease. So this fallacy was there when we used to do Sanger. We used to do Sanger in one gene, variant found, directly report that this is disease causing. Now we are able to look everywhere and maybe somewhere else uh, uh, a variant might be there. So this, this is very important in, in practice also, this will happen like especially when you order for a test and uh, the uh, phenotype is not properly given. Like uh, he, my friend Girish, so he has a very nice anecdote on this that uh, there was a patient uh, uh, who came to a pediatrician and uh, he had a difficulty cl climbing up from sitting position. So he had weakness, uh, 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 like the doctor thought that he has weakness uh, of getting up from sitting position. So he has written the phenotype, weakness of uh, getting up from uh, sitting position, exome sequencing. So exome sequencing report has given a VOUS in NEB nemaline rod myopathy gene. Okay, because the phenotype is of myopathy, there is a VOUS in myopathy, the way report has been given. Okay, now this patient with the report uh, reached him. Now he is a very good expert in 
skeletal dysplasia. So when the patient walked in, he saw and he saw that this patient is really a case of Morquio syndrome. Okay. So he told the laboratory, look for variants in the Morquio syndrome. And then the laboratory saw and they said there is a pathogenic variant in the Morquio syndrome. Okay. Now, because the phenotype was not there, although the pathogenic variant is there, exome data is there, but because phenotype that was put by the laboratory was myopathy. So you will not even look at uh, genes. Uh, so unless you do a global analysis, unbiased analysis, this is bound to happen. That if you don't look for things what is in the correct, the phenotype is not correct, then you will label anything that you find what is related from your mind as cause of that disease, okay? So these fallacies still happen even today. And so to make it very specific, that is what uh, Dr. Amita is saying that one of the criteria in ACMG guidelines is a functional assay, but that functional assay is like you create that mutation artificially because this patient is already having this variant as well as other variant. We don't know which is the one which is making that phenotype. So you create that variant artificially in the laboratory and then show that the background is normal. When you create the variant, there is an abnormality. So there you are sure of the background that is normal. When you create the variant, you found the abnormality. That is a much more stronger evidence, okay? So now you have collected all these evidence, but this again evidence is like how a detective is collecting evidence, but a detective cannot make a final judgment. So there is a judge sitting there who will go through all these evidence that has been created and ultimately decide. So now, after you were a detective collecting this evidence, now you need to become a judge. And for you, the constitution given is the ACMG guidelines that were released, uh, I think, almost 2015. Yeah. So since 2015, they have stood the test of time. Still, we are using them. And so these guidelines is quite a complex set of uh, requirements which you fill one by one. Ultimately, but what you get out of these guidelines is every variant has to be classified in these five, pathogenic, likely pathogenic, benign, likely benign, or variant of uncertain significance. Now, how you go about doing it? So there are the same evidences that we spoke about are used. So the population data, the computational data, that is what we saw, the prediction, the functional data, the segregation analysis data, the de novo data, allelic uh, like cis or trans, other databases. So these all things what we discussed, the same are used, and then they have given strong or weak scores to each of these. Now this is very difficult to remember, nobody remembers, neither we remember this. But this criteria were made by multiple people sitting together. And then as it happens with anything that is complex, you have the computer to help us. So a computational algorithm is made using this criteria to ultimately give you the final uh, analysis. And so what do we mean when it is pathogenic or likely pathogenic? So pathogenic means that there is 1% probability that it is not likely to be pathogenic. Likely pathogenic means there is 10% probability that it is not likely to be pathogenic. So you are taking more than 90% probability as pathogenic and the same way for the likely benign. And between 10 and 90%, whatever remains is VOUS. So you can see a huge amount of variants are all going to be VOUS. It is only the 10% this side are going to be benign. 10% on the other side are going to be pathogenic, okay? So now you have tools to do this also. What the ACMG guidelines is doing, now you have tools like Warsum is one, the other one is Franklin, okay? These tools, again, we routinely use. So these tools help us to put this evidence and then get the ACMG classification also. Now, again, as I said, these tools also are not experts. They are just helping us. So just like you will not believe what comes out of phase two gene, similarly don't believe what comes out of Warsum or Franklin. But good thing is that these tools will give you what evidence they have used to come to this conclusion. 
that you should be able to understand and that if you have seen what we have discussed today you should be easily able to understand that and if you understand that you yourself can make a decision okay they are correct or not okay so varsam is one such uh, database this uh, varsam i think they allow only one variant per day to be used but franklin is a very good database uh, a tool which uh, is free as of now to use so let us see how it goes about so we have this one variant here crtap gene you have put this variant here so it is showing you the details of this variant so this variant is a termination variant so it's a stop codon the verdict is pathogenic so don't take at face value it is pathogenic it is giving you here what evidences it has used to say that it is pathogenic so what are the evidences one it says pvs1 so pvs1 pm2 pp3 these are codes coming from the acmg guidelines so pvs1 it says null variant or a nonsense variant okay and loss of function variants is the mechanism of disease in this disease so always remember there are some diseases where gain of function causes disease their loss of function variant may not cause disease although it is a very severe disease uh, severe looking variant okay so here the variant effect has to match the mechanism of disease in that particular disease so in crtap gene it's a known mechanism of disease that loss of function variants cause disease so it's a strong evidence then you have another evidence nomad exomes homozygous allele count is zero that means there is no homozygous person in the normal population this is one more evidence third evidence is that computational criteria are predicting it to be pathogenic using all three evidences putting through the acmg pipeline it is coming to a verdict of pathogenic now you are convinced with these evidences you can report this as pathogenic okay similarly we take the second variant now in arsa gene so this is now a substitution variant a missense variant okay so missense variant now you are thinking it may or may not be pathogenic so what are the evidences the first evidence is that this variant is not found in normal population okay so it is not very common benign polymorphism there is a alternative variant at this location so our variant is c2g a c2t variant has been reported okay so our variant is not reported but same location there is one more variant so it is a good evidence that you have then the reports of missense variants in that particular domains are missense variants reported in that domain in other patients and what are the functional predictions from the software so with all these criteria the variant is reaching a level of significance as likely pathogenic not as pathogenic but that is the prediction that acmg guideline gives pathogenic likely pathogenic we consider them same for genetic counseling treatment prenatal diagnosis okay so this is likely pathogenic here it is not pathogenic because it is not reaching that much higher evidence criteria okay now we have another variant here so this variant again is a termination variant so termination variant should have been pathogenic isn't it but here termination variant is considered as a uncertain significance so why is it so there is a strong evidence null variant this is mechanism is loss of function that is approved there is pathogenicity prediction software one of them is saying that it is pathogenic but in clinvar this variant has been reported as benign by two submitters so there must be some patient who is normal or not having that disease but has this variant so now there is confusion and once there is confusion better to keep it in the uncertain significance you don't want to take any decisions irreversible decisions when there is confusion so this although it is a stop codon it still remains in the uncertain significance now let us see another variant here so this variant is again a stop codon variant you can see okay no no not stop codon this is a it's not a star it's a synonymous variant okay so synonymous variant we should have said directly benign but it's not benign it's likely benign why is it so this variant is not present in the normal population 
okay although it is synonymous and predicted benign but it is not present in normal population so we are not sure about its benignness so we are keeping it as likely benign whereas if there is a variant like this then this variant is classified as benign because it is very common in normal population it is predicted benign by computational software no doubt now this is benign so is that clear so benign likely benign pathogenic likely pathogenic vous when in doubt always it goes as vous when clarity is there you put as benign or pathogenic okay so the franklin is another uh, nice tool similar to warsum where again you can put your variant and it will again give you the same kind of classification as well as how it has reached that classification what is it so this is uh, it depends which uh, uh, build of uh, genome has been used so when you do exome or uh, genome sequencing when the raw data comes we map it to the reference genome so the reference genome the earlier version was hg18 then they improved it because our reference genome was not complete there were gaps so newer newer version like your mobile new version comes software android new version comes like that hg18 was earlier version then hg19 now what is there is hg38 okay so now either you can use hg19 or hg38 depending on what has been used by the lab to do mapping mapping of the raw data to the reference genome if you put this wrongly the variant it will get confused it will not give proper interpretation okay hg19 was used by the laboratory you put hg19 hg38 was used you change it to hg38 this will be written in the report that you get okay here here uh, so if you go here in examples it will show you if there is time we can do it live also here you you go here snp cnv you click on this it will show examples how to put just put here the c dot number and your variant how to put that format also you'll get it here okay so now let us see a example of for the same thing so now we have done exome and we found a homozygous likely pathogenic variant in a gaspi so here what evidence is we have used so the first evidence this is how in the report people will write so the same thing in more understandable terms so here in the report we will write a homozygous missense variant in exon 5 of gusb gene that results in amino acid change from alanine to valine at 298 position was detected this is the location or type or effect based evidence the next will be this variant has not been reported as normal variation in 1000 genome exome variant server exact genome ad whatever this is the normal population database evidence then this variant has also not been reported in other patients with slide disease or mps7 in omeng clinvar this is the known variant database evidence then in silico pathogenicity programs like cad fred score and mutation tester predicted it to be disease causing this is the in silico pathogenicity evidence and very important evidence the clinical features of patient match with the phenotype described in mps7 mps7 is known to be caused by homozygous compound heterozygous variants in, in gusp this is the most important evidence which the software cannot put which you as clinician has to decide okay so even after everything else genotype phenotype correlation is the very important kind of a evidence that you are going to use before labeling the patient okay what is it are the nmid so nmid is the transcript id so everything has been given a name we have said down syndrome uh, uh, edward syndrome like that every transcript is given id we always want to give names to things no so transcript is the rna which is made from the dna so why we have to give name is because you have alternative transcripts you have multiple transcripts which come from and that is what adds to the complexity yesterday we saw humans are more complex because of the repetitive dna further complexity is added that you have multiple transcripts from 
one genome. So you have one genome sequence, multiple RNA sequence, and multiple RNA sequence will give rise to multiple protein sequences. So the protein ones are called isoforms. The RNA are called as alternative transcripts. So because you have multiple transcripts, again, the transcript numbering will change. So if you don't use the correct NMID, always remember, if you don't use the correct NMID, again, the numbering will be wrong, your interpretation will be wrong. So these numberings have to be very, very clear because you are using computer, you are using automated things. If you put in garbage in, garbage out, you put in a wrong variant, you'll get a different interpretation. If you put the transcript ID different, if you put the number different, if you put the variant different, you may get a totally different interpretation. So that you have to be very careful about, okay? So now, ultimately, after doing all this, the genotype-phenotype match is what the clinician does, and that is a very important evidence that you need to keep in mind before telling the patient to do anything further, okay? So what do you do once a VOUS is reported? One thing what you can do is check the variant interpretation yourself. Now I hope all of you should be able to do variant interpretation using the tools that I have told you. Check if the clinical features of the patient are matching with the VOUS. So that's the reverse phenotyping. Mendelian segregation, if it has not been done, it should be done. That will change your classification many times. If a functional assay is available, you can check. If some lab is doing a functional assay, you can try to contact them. Very importantly, follow up the patient periodically because these classifications are not final. What is benign today may become pathogenic tomorrow, depending on more evidence available. Usually benign will not go to pathogenic, but VOUS may go to likely pathogenic, VOUS may go to likely benign. And this has happened many times because of various reasons. So it's a dynamic classification. It's not a static or a fixed classification. That's why follow up the patients periodically and do a reclassification of the variant after six months, after one year. You can again try to use the same tools and try to reclassify. And then a different interpretation may come out. Whatever it is, do not take irreversible actions like prenatal diagnosis, therapy, or genetic counseling based on a vivo US. This is very, very important for everyone to know both from our moral, ethical principle, as well as from legal principle that based on a vivo US, don't take any decisions, okay? So why this reclassification of variant happens? It can happen because of a novel gene being identified. We have 19,500 genes. We know diseases for about 6,500 or 7,000. 13,000 genes, we still don't know what disease they cause. Every month, there will be one or two novel genes described. So novel gene, then your classification may change. Or reclassification of the variant because new data from population frequency, functional assay has come, that will lead to the reclassification. So this is an example. We had this siblings, 16 and 18 year old, uh, who Dr. Pradnya had seen in our department. And they had recurrent episodes of steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. So we had done exome for them in 2018. And that time nothing was found, some uncertain significance, one variant was reported, but nothing could be found. So we kept these patients on follow-up, two siblings, same phenotype. We did not find a diagnosis. They came back again in 2022 and we analyzed the same data and we found that there is a homozygous stop codon variant which is likely pathogenic in this gene. Now we were surprised why this gene was not reported by that particular laboratory in 2018. When it was already there, we just reanalyzed the data. We didn't do the exome again. And then when we saw, we saw that this gene was reported to cause nephrotic syndrome in 2020. So in 2018, there was no way that the lab would have known that this gene causes nephrotic syndrome. So novel genes will change your interpretation as more information becomes available, okay? So summary is that proper interpretation of variant is far more important than finding the variant. It is very easy to find the variant nowadays. So many machines are available and knowledge is changing so fast that clinicians have to be aware of recent information. And there can be a lot of fallacies in interpretation of variants, especially we are depending on a laboratory who has no access to the further patient details. They are just reporting based on what phenotype you have provided. So doing further analysis 
clinical correlation of variant reverse phenotyping this is very important in today's era of high throughput genomic assays